Hello everyone, thank you for attending this session. My name is Mario Vázquez, I work for Red Hat in the Telco Engineering Group, helping our partners and customers to run their 5G workloads on OpenShift. And today with me I have Alberto Lozada. Thank you Mario and thank you everyone for joining this session. My name is Alberto Lozada. I work at Red Hat as a senior software engineer currently focusing in the telco space. So my background is mainly systems administration. I work as a security consultant a long time ago and for the last five plus years I've been involved in Kubernetes and, and OpenShift. So in this 40 minutes, 45 minutes presentation plus questions, um, we will deal with the security context constraints, shortened SCCs in, in OpenShift, which is a huge and dense topic. So the main goal after this presentation is that you understand how SCCs can help you to limit the permissions given to your applications and how your applications can run or how you can configure them with the minimum required permissions in the OpenShift world. So let's move to the what are SCCs. So let's put some context first. So historically, Kubernetes didn't have any way to apply security policies to the, to the applications that were running in your cluster. So basically all, all applications could get high privileges. They could run as privilege container, which means that they could use any kernel capability, any, uh, any syscall can make any syscall, I mean, pretty much the same as a privilege process in your system. So Red Hat, since it wanted to be a Kubernetes offering uh, for enterprise customers, so realized that lack of security policies to have some kind of control of what applications can do in, in, in the Kubernetes clusters. So SCCs were included into OpenShift from the, from the very beginning, and they are still an OpenShift thing since they were not merged into Kubernetes upstream. Unlike role-based access control, for instance, that which started being OpenShift specific, and now it's part of Kubernetes out of the box. So by default, OpenShift comes with SCCs. So when you install an OpenShift cluster, it comes with eight SCCs actually that are thought to be to, or to cover most use cases. It is worth mentioning that there were some, some similar security controls introduced into Kubernetes like the pod security policy, but didn't flourish. I mean, the currently PSP is deprecated in Kube 1.21 and then also there are some well there are some other proposals by the community here you can find a link in the slides if you are interested like the pod security admission and there are others like the open policy agent which some folks are using as a replacement so but what what are SCCs? what are security context constraints so similar to to the way that role-based access control controls user access and authorization the administrators, the cluster administrators, can use security context constraints to control permissions for pods. So these permissions include, include actions that, that a pod, I mean, as a pod, I mean a, a collection of containers or one container. So actions that a pod can perform. For instance, it can change the owner of a file or the pod can run as a root, but also include the resources that this pod can, can access from the node it is running. It can access to the network, to the host network or even to the file system of the host the pod is running. So SCCs is a Kubernetes resource that defines a set of conditions that a pod must run in order to be accepted into the system. And I want to be clear here. So SCCs are not added directly to a pod. They are assigned to users. So this user or service account is the one responsible for running the application, for running the pod and those permissions or restrictions are somehow transferred to the pod. Okay, so it's important to note as well that SCCs are managed by only by cluster admins in OpenShift. So uh, cluster admins can create, delete or modify SCCs. And here you can see a list of things that SCCs can do. So an administrator, when they create the SCC resource, it can control if a pod can run uh, privileged containers. So, I mean, with that, I mean, uh, even if, you, if the user sets the security context specification of the pod as privilege equal, equals true, so the developer configures the pod specification and sets this, this flag to true, if the SCC does not allow to do that, then the pod will fail to start. I mean, so there are other things that, that uh, an administrator can control, like the capabilities given to a container, the SC Linux, the user ID, the user that is running the container, etc. 
uh, summing up, I mean, with, with, so I want to be clear here. So summing up with SCCs, you control a lot of permissions that your application may or may not have. So one of these permissions that can be managed, for instance, are capabilities. Or, or say it in another way, so in, in an SEC resource, a cluster admin can add, remove or allow to add capabilities in their specification section. So what are Linux capabilities? So let's explain them a little bit first. So in traditional Unix implementations, previously to kernel 2.2, there were two categories of processes. I mean, privileged processes running with effective UID 0 that can bypass all kernel permission checks. And there are another kind of processes called unprivileged whose permissions are always checked to be sure if the, it can execute the, the tasks that they were requested. So the idea of capabilities is simple. So just split up all the possible privileged kernel calls into groups of similar functionality. So then we can assign the, the, the processes only the subset of uh, privileged kernel calls they need instead of the, of the whole cake. So I, th I think the picture represents here very well the concept. So we can see how on previous kernel 2.2 root had all the permissions. Then it were, I mean, the permissions were divided into groups of capabilities, and then it is possible, even possible, to restrict capabilities from even the root, the root user. So we can see in the last picture that the root user doesn't have all the capabilities, all the permissions. And then remember, so I think he, this is the, the the takeaway here in this slide. So the power of root doesn't come from having the name of root or for for having the UID zero. So the power of root is based in a, in a concept inside the Linux kernel called capabilities. So in OpenShift, uh, you manage kernel capabilities uh, that are given to your application through SCCs. So for instance, here you have a few examples of uh, capabilities that can be managed in, in, in OpenShift. For instance, the net row, which is used to to, to, to manage raw and packet sockets. For instance, the change owner, which makes arbitrary changes to UIDs and GIDs. You have also the famous NetBind service, which uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's required, it's needed for, for um, allowing the users to, to open up a port below 1024. And from network capabilities, for, for instance, comes to my mind the NetAdmin. Also, it's important because it basically adds no restriction in controlling network interfaces or configuration. I mean, you can configure the NIC to capture traffic. It allows you to configure the NIC to control traffic. So in OpenShift, some of these capabilities are configured by default in the cryo container runtime. I mean, if you are interested, you can take a look at the cryo enable default uh, capabilities in the link included in this slide. So, so these, default, these default capabilities that are included in cryo are assigned to every container. But it doesn't mean that they are effectively included to all containers. So, so actually, as I mentioned, the SCCs can add, can drop or allow capabilities to your applications. And you can end up running your application with less capabilities than the default ones given by the runtime. So that's, for instance, the case of the restricted SCC that we will see later. Another important concept is that uh, capabilities are handled at runtime and are independent of the container image. So you can launch a development version of a container and give it tons of capabilities in a development lab, uh, for instance, by assign assigning a permissive SCC, but then launch the same container in production and assign a different SCC, which gives, gives, gives a very few set of capabilities. So SCCs in OpenShift uh, makes, makes it easier to manage capabilities. And yes, uh, finally, uh, last but not least, there is no magic tool to, that will tell you which capabilities are actually required to your application. So it's, it is or should be the developer of the application who is in charge of knowing the, the capabilities that are needed to run the, the application. Another security feature that, uh, that can be managed by SCC are the secure compute profiles. So SECOMP can be seen as a step farther in setting the minimum required permissions to your app. So as, as, as written many times, I mean, containers typically run a single application. So SECOMP or Security Compute Profiles allows for filtering the syscalls directly, the syscalls invoked by that process, and then uh, can be used to, to, to restrict which syscalls a given application is allowed to execute. So previously we talked about capabilities which can be seen as, as a group of syscalls, and now we are dealing with syscalls at a much lower level.
So Secomp, broadly said, can be seen as a, as a firewall on syscalls. So you are actually allowing or denying syscalls from your app. And there are many projects that are actually using this, this technology, like Android, Chrome, or Flatpak, etc. OpenShift uh, ships with a second profile that is used by default, unless otherwise specified, and can be found in each node in the ATC cryo secom.json file. We will see an example of the, of, the, of the format of this file in the next slide. So the default second profile limits a lot the number of available syscalls. Of, of, of course, it can be replaced. You can create your own second profile into the nodes and then create a new SCC to select the proper second for your, for your needs. Creating second profiles, as it has been mentioned, with capabilities require deep knowledge of the application. I mean, knowing syscall, the syscalls that are executed, etc. There are some tools like, like the OC second BPF project mentioned in the slides. And this project sets up a, a Podman hook and intercepts the, the syscalls executed by the container. It, it will even list them in, in a JSON file, which is ready to be used as a second profile out of the box. So it's, it, it is worth taking a look at the project to understand better second and the syscalls that are used by your application. And then also it's important, happen to many of us, when make sure if you are using this, this project, when creating second profiles, you are using it with Podman, so select the proper runtime of your Kubernetes distribution since different runtimes may execute different syscalls. So in case of OpenShift, uh, it is using the RunC uh, container runtime under the hood. So this is an example of uh, the second profile JSON structure that I mentioned before. So still, at least for me, it's like a firewall configuration. So there is a default action if the syscall is not in the list which in this case is the action equals to erno, which means the night. Then it comes the different architectures apply. Uh, notice that the architectures are important since syscall IDs doesn't have to match uh, syscall names in all architectures. And next we have an array, the, the array list of the syscalls explicitly allow in this case. So finally, and, and recently as well, you can use also the new action called SCMP ACT lock to find out which syscalls are required by your applications. I mean, you can use the, 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 the project that I mentioned in the previous slide, but also you can use this in a similar way as a SC Linux permissive node for me. I mean, uh, this lock action will allow all syscalls. I mean, no one is denied and will lock the ones that are not explicitly allowed to an audit log file. So then you can take a look at this audit log file and check those ones that probably you need to explicitly include explicitly allow in your application. Okay, so until now we, uh, we describe it what RSCCs, uh, we define what are capabilities and second profiles, and we also know that they can be managed by SCCs. So next, what we are going to do is visit the eight default SCCs that comes in OpenShift. So these are the ones that comes by default with any OpenShift installation. Uh, we will go deeper into each one, but although these are expected to cover most use cases, as mentioned, it, cluster admin can create custom SCCs to meet uh, their needs. One thing that is important is please do not edit, delete or change these eight ones. Uh, do not modify them since it can cause damage to your cluster. I mean, take into account that there are OpenShift infra infrastructure components that are using these SCCs as well. So if, the, if this, this eight or the ones that are here doesn't meet your requirements, please create a new one. So the first one is the restricted SCC. So this is the security context constraint used by most of the pods and the most restrictive as, as its name implies. So it is granted by default to all authenticated users. So this means that if you can you create an account, I mean a user or, or service account, the, this SEC will be granted uh, and, and only this one to the new user. So in, in the case where this SEC is applied to the user running your pod or pods, uh, the restricted will ensure that the pods cannot run as privilege. So it will also ensure that the pods are running with a pre-allocated range of UIDs instead of UID 0 or any other user ID or I mean UID 0 I mean root. Uh, same for the MCS, I mean the, the, the multi-category security, which is part of the of the levels SC Linux context. Uh, 
So you are forcing uh, your applications to run with a pre-allocated SE Linux label assigned to the namespace and cannot be changed uh, with the restricted SEC applied to the, to the application. However, uh, this SEC actually allows to use any supplemental groups to your pod. So in case you need, for instance, accessing to share uh, network storage, you will need a uh, supplemental group so you can mount this uh, storage remotely. Obviously, um, the restricted one uh, does not allow you to access to the host file system or host network directly. So this is the most secure SCC and it should be or used always if, if possible. Uh, second one is the any UID SCC, which provides the same features of the restricted, of the restricted SCC, but in this case allows uh, users to run with any UID and any GID. So this means that you can set in your pod configuration that you want your applications to run as a specific UID, even as UID zero. So if running as, as root, then it means that the, that the container process is running as root in your node, I mean, both inside and, and outside the container. So however, uh, don't panic. I mean, take into account that SC Linux also plays an important role here adding a, a layer of protection to the node. The third SCC is the host access. Host access permits access to all host namespaces, which means access to the node file system, PIDs, IPC, and, and network. However, it still requires pods to be run with a UID and SC Linux context allocated to the namespace. So, well, anyway, this SCC should only be used by, by trusted pods. So grant uh, with caution. Next one is the host mount any UID. So it provides all the features of the restricted SCC, but allows host mounts and any UID by a pod. So this is primarily used by the persistent volume recycler. But if you are using for something else, be careful since you can mount host volumes and also set the UID GID of your container to, to any. The fifth one is the host network SCC. Uh, it allows using host networking and host ports, but it still constrains ports to run with a UAD and SC Linux context allocated by the namespace. So this means that with this SCC you can execute ports that will be able to see, use and, and, and attach the node network directly. So an example in OpenShift that uh, of a pod or of an application that is using this, this SCC is the router pod which uses this SCC to listen, uh, to listen in port 80 and 443 in the physical network of the worker nodes. The next one is the node exporter. This must be used only by Prometheus. As you can see, it has a lot of permissions, host access to file system, PID, network, plus running as any user. So please do not use it. It's used for monitoring only. The sixth one is non-root SCC. So this is exactly the same as the restricted one, but in this case you can configure your pod to run with any UID except root or UID zero. I mean, we can say in another way, so it's exactly the same as any UID, but you cannot use zero. I mean, you can choose any other UID except uh, being root. So this is mainly used by, by applications that need a predictable user, which is not root, and there is no other permission required. So I, can imagine, for instance, a Postgres uh, database container that requires an, a specific user or maybe an image, container image that has been built with a specific user and cannot be changed to run with the, with the ones that are pre-allocated by OpenShift. And finally, the privileged container. I mean, it permits, as you can see, access to all privileged and host features and the ability to run uh, as any user, any group, any FS group, and with any SC Linux context. So it is clear that's the most relaxed SCC and should be used only for cluster administration. So this SCC allows a pod or a container, I mean, to control everything in the node is running. So only trusted workloads should use it. And even we can discuss it if, it's, uh, if, if it makes more sense to create a custom one, a tailored SCC that meets the requirements of your app application. And uh, as an example of applications that are using this uh, privilege SCC in OpenShift is the TuneD operator or the TuneD application, since it needs control to the host uh, in order to apply the different TuneD profiles. I mean, it needs access to low-level configurations. 
And I would like to note here that even if your application is using the privilege SCC, it doesn't mean your pod is privileged. I mean, you must explicitly configure the pod to demand that privilege. And now we are going to talk about OpenShift SCC strategies and I will hand it over to Mario. Thank you, Roberto. So in this slide, uh, we are going to introduce the different um, annotations that are used by SCCs. So in OpenShift, every namespace will get three annotations related to SCCs by default. So the first one is the MCS one, uh, which basically defines the so Linux MCS um, configuration that our pods will get by default. Um, then we will get um, a group, a range of uh, super meta groups, groups IDs that we can use. So in this case, this will be the first uh, group ID. And then we, we have 10,000 more groups IDs that we can use after the, the first one. And the same goes for the UID range. So we get a range of, of UIDs that we can use in our pods. This, is, this will be the first one and then we have 10,000 more. Okay, and then um, the objective of these annotations or of these settings is provide a better isolation between projects. So for example, every project or namespace will get a unique Salinux context and UID GID range. Um, so other namespaces or projects cannot use these uh, ranges on their applications. Um, next, we are going to introduce the different SEC strategies that we have. SEC strategies control the security features that a pod has access to. There are four different SEC strategies. So the first one um, that we define is the run as user, which basically controls which user IDs can be used by the containers in our applications. There are four different configurations. The first, the first one is must run as, which basically defines a specific UID that has to be used by the application. The second one is the must run as range, where we define a range of UIDs that can be used and any UID between that range, inside that range, that range um, uh, can be used by the applications. Then we have the must run as non-root, which means that every UID can be used, but um, the UID zero, which is the roots UID. And then finally, we have the run as any, which basically means that you can run as any UID, including roots UID zero. Next, we have the Selenux context, which basically controls which Selenux um, context is used by the containers. As we mentioned um, earlier, our namespace will get um, uh, will get assigned one default MCS setting. That's what will be used if we are running in must run as mode. And then we have the run as any, where we could uh, change the Selenux MCS configuration for our pods. Then in supplemental groups, um, this controls which file system groups are added to the containers, supplemental groups, and this is mainly used for search threads. There are two possible configurations, must run as and run as any. In the next slides, uh, we'll get into the details of the supplemental groups and on the next setting, which is FS group. Okay, so FS group um, basically controls which file system groups are added to the container supplemental group. It's used for block storage mainly. And again, it has two possible configurations, must run as or run as any. Okay, next topic is the privilege escalation. So the allow privilege escalation controls whether a process can gain more privileges than its parent process. So this Boolean directly controls whether the non new privs flag gets set on the container process. Um, this setting, the allow privilege escalation, will be always true when the container runs as privileged container or has the sysadmin capability. And this uh, boolean that we're talking here, the no new prips, is consumed by the execb system calls, as you can read in the kernel documentation. Then um, the Kubernetes design proposal for getting this uh, boolean added can be found in the link in the slides. Um, 
and then if we have a process that has the no new preps, uh, what will happen is that that process or their children cannot gain any additional privileges. Uh, the process cannot unset this uh, boolean once it has been set. Uh, process cannot change UID or GID or gain any other capabilities, even when you are using set UID binaries or binaries with file capabilities. Um, and then Linux security modules like Selenix can only transition to a process type with fewer privileges. And you can continue reading about this in the link on the slide. But still, this might sound scary, but being able to run privilege escalation operations is required under certain circumstances. Like, for example, when your application uses uh, set UID binaries or when your application uses binaries with file capabilities. You can see some risk, but um, in this case, even if file capabilities can cause a privilege escalation, we have great tools today to avoid bots from getting such capabilities, for example, via SCCs where the restricted SCC does a pretty good job limiting the number of capabilities available for pods by default. On the other hand, we have the becoming root or executing as root problem, uh, which in this case, SCCs are not helping that much since all the default SCCs that we have in OpenSIF have this setting, a low privilege escalation set to true to maximize compatibility with the applications. So what can we do about this second uh, risk? So the Red Hat security team is working on the creation of a more restrictive default SCC. So that work can be tracked on the link on the slides. Um, and at this point, if you want to drop privilege escalation, you should create a custom SCC until we provide a more restricted default. Also, you should avoid using set ready binaries and use file capabilities instead. So instead of running as root, for example, uh, just provide the minimum required capabilities to your applications. And as a last resort, you can configure audit rules um, that can log these execv calls where the effective UID has changed to zero to keep track of containers abusing set UID sudo to become root on your applications, right? So now next, next uh, thing is how can a workload get access to use a specific SCC? There are two ways that a workload will get access to an SCC. The user creating the workload has access to that SCC, or the service account used by the workload has access to that SCC. For example, and this is a, a common pitfall in OpenSIF, right? So when creating regular workloads on OpenSIF, deployments, stateful sets, daemon sets, etc. The pod is not created by the user who sends the deployment to the API. So if I'm creating the deployment, I'm not really creating the pod, right? So the deployment will create a replica set and the replica set will create the pod, which means that in this case, the only way of getting access to the SCC will be if the service account has access to it. So let's say that our deployment or our workload requires any UID and the service account assigned to that pod or to that deployment actually does not have access to the uh, any UID SCC so that pod won't run even if I'm logged as cluster admin and I have access to any SCC it won't work because I'm not the one creating the pod the replica set is in, on the other hand, when you create a pod directly, so you're connected to the OpenSIF cluster using the CLI or using the web console, um, that user might have access to different SCCs. So if I create the pod with my user, then now I can get access to any SCC, which basically means that even if the service account assigned to the pod does not have access to a specific SCC, um, if my user has, the pod will be able to use it. So before moving on, um, the common pitfall is that sometimes uh, people try things like, okay, I'm going to create this pod uh, and let's see if, if it works. Okay, and the pod works because that has been created with a user, which is cluster admin, for example. And then when they move from a pod to a deployment, 
and then try to create the deployment again with their user, it fails. And that's basically because at that point, the user is not the one creating the pod anymore. It's the replica set and the replica set will have a service account defined and that service account defined uh, should have access to the SSC. Okay, and now that we know how a workload gets access to an SCC, next thing we need to know is how, uh, how SCCs are ordered. So if we have access to more than one SCC, uh, how OpenSea decides which SCC gets assigned to a workload. So the first thing that will happen is that when we create uh, a workload, an admission controller will create a list of potential SCCs that can be assigned to the pod based on the pod specification and the SCCs that the user or the service account creating the pod can use. Okay, then for example, the pod spec says that the pod must run as root. Then any SCC that can be used by the service account assigned to the pod, which allows the pod to run as root, um, will be added to, to that list. Okay, let's say that in that list we have three SCCs that allow a pod to run as root. So now we need to order those three uh, and, and pick one of those three. So once that potential list of SCCs is created, then the SCCs in that list will be ordered as follows. So if the SCCs have different priorities, then the ones with the higher priority go first. If priority is the same, the most restrictive SCC will go first. And if priority and restriction level are the same, then they will be ordered by alphabetical order. So that's how you will uh, pick uh, one SCC. So the, the one on the top will be the one that will be assigned to the, uh, to the pod. So we introduced the concept of admission in the previous slide. So now um, let's review what's an admission controller um, not in very detail, but just a basic explanation. So, as you might know, Kubernetes has admission controllers which validate and mutate requests before they get persisted into ETCD. In OpenSea, we have an admission controller that takes care of configuring the proper SSC on every pod in the cluster. The code for this admission controller can be found here, and then the workflow of an API request and how it gets through the different admission controllers can be seen in this DRM below. So whenever an API request gets made, it gets authenticated and authorized, then it will get through the mutating and mission controllers, which basically will mutate the request. Uh, we'll see an example in the next slide. Then the, we will run the object schema validation. Since we mutated the request, we need to make sure that it, it, um, it, it can be validated against the schema. And then we will get through the validating admission controllers, which will run some validation on the um, objects. And then finally, if everything goes well, it will be persisted to ATCD. And at that point, the controllers uh, will start reacting to that change. <clears throat> so the mutating um, admission controller, right? Um, have you ever created a workload like a deployment or a pod? Um, without specifying any security context um, and you wonder why it worked. So that's, for example, because the admission controller mutates the pod definition and adds the correct information. In, for example, the, the SCC admission controller will make sure that their pods run with the least privileges possible by default. So for example, in these um, in this, um, examples below, the number one is what we sent to the API server, right? So we, as you can see, we didn't specify any security context. And then in the number two figure, this is what we got persisted to ETCD. So as you can see, uh, we got the security context um, information added by default. So this was done by the mutating uh, mission controller. So, now we want to talk about uh, common pitfalls with SCCs ordering. Um, so let's let's go for them. So let's say that you have a container image that's based on on its metadata that's ba that based on its metadata runs as root, but in the pod spec you don't specify it. Providing that your service account has access to two SCCs and both have the same priority, 
one that allows bots to run with UID 0 and another one that forces your bot to use an UID from a range, your bot will be assigned to the later since you didn't specify the root requirement in the spec. Also keep in mind that cluster admin role has full privileges, including the one that allowed it to use any SEC. So this is what we talked uh, earlier about creating pods directly. Uh, so if you create pods manually uh, with the admin users, keep in mind that you can uh, face this issue. Um, last, um, avoid assigning high priorities to your SCCs, um, so your custom SCCs. This might cause issues in prioritization if you create SCCs with higher priority than the defaults and you don't have the correct pod spec in place. So for example, if with OpenSea we have the any UID with a priority of, priority of 10, you don't want to create any custom SCC with a priority higher than 10. Otherwise you can cause issues. Okay, and now we are going to talk about some Linux capabilities in Kubernetes. So uh, as we have been saying, capabilities in Kubernetes have some limitations at the moment when not using UID0 on your workloads. And that's why you have to use five capabilities at the moment. There is an open issue to solve ambient capabilities uh, on the community, which basically uh, will bring ambient capabilities support to Kubernetes, and then uh, we'll be, uh, we will be able to use ambient capabilities instead of file capabilities. And then uh, last will be user namespaces support. That will be helpful in the future. Uh, this support has just made it to Cryo and, and it will take some time um, to be GA, but uh, this will be also a, a useful feature when working with, when working with uh, workloads that require UID0 and also capabilities. And with that, we are done with the um, theory and we can get started with demos. Okay, so let's get started with the demos. Okay, so in this first demo, uh, we're going to see how a service account can get access to use an SCC by directly granting access to the security context constraint to the service account. So first thing that we need is a namespace. So we're creating this namespace name SCC fun. Then we will create our service account, which is named test SA1. Next, uh, we are going to add access to the any UID SCC to the test SA1 service account. And now we can check who can use the any UID SCC. As we can see, we have our service account listed here. Okay, so that's a way that we can provide access to an SCC for one of our service accounts. In the next demo, what we are going to do is instead of uh, running these commands, we are going to create a role and a role binding that will allow a specific service account to get access to the any UID SCC. So first of all, we are creating a new uh, service account, which is named test SA2. And now we are going to create uh, a role in this namespace. As you can see, the role provides access to the security context constraints, to the uh, resource any UID, and it allows the use of the pair use. Okay. So um, next thing that we're going to do is we're going to create the role binding. And here in the role binding, we're creating this use any UID RB, and we are providing access to the use any UID role that we created in the previous step. And we are granting this role to the service account named test SA2. And now if we can check who can use this um, any UID SCC, we can see that we have the test SA2 as well, on top of the test SA1 that we provided earlier. So we can see that we have the test SA2 listed here. And then in this last demo, what we're going to do is we're going to see how SSCs are ordered in case that a service account can access multiple SSCs. So first, we're going to create a service account that we will use as a regular user that we can impersonate. So it will be test user. Then um, we will add the edit role to this user, test user. So we can create things on namespace. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to provide access to this user to the SCC restricted. This is not really required uh, because 
every authenticated user will have access to the restricted SCC, but since we are going to use who can commands and if the user has not direct access to this SCC, like if it gets this access by a, a inherited group or something like that, it won't show up. So in order to make things easier to understand, we're going to provide direct access to the restricted SCC. Okay, and now that we have this SCC, what we're going to do is we're going to create a pod. As you can see, this is a simple pod, um, which is using our test user, and uh, it's using a simple application image. So now that we have the pod created, we can run this command that will tell us with SCC will allow the workload to enter the cluster. And in this case, we can see that it will be allowed by restricted. So we can create a pod as this user. Okay. So we created a pod. And now, um, if we check the SCC that was assigned to the pod, we will see that the SCC is restricted. Now let's do something different. So now we are going to grant access to the any UID SCC to this test user service account. Okay. So now that we have access, uh, what, what happens if we run the SCC review again? Now we can see that this pod will be allowed uh, to enter the cluster by these two SCCs, any UID and restricted. Um, so our pod specification doesn't have anything that will require it to run with any UID. So let's check why any UID has preference over restricted. So as we can see, um, the SCC any UID has a priority of 10 while restricted has no value, which actually equals uh, to zero. So now if we create the pod again, so first let's get it delete deleted from the cluster. And now let's get it created again. And we will see that the SEC that was assigned this time is any UID because the any UID has more priority than the restricted SEC. And this uh, quick way of, of checking the SECs for your pods Instead of doing the OYAML, you can run something like this, and then you will get the pod name and a new column, which is the applied SCC that will give you the SCC that is used by the pod. And, and this concludes the first demo. Okay, so in this demo, what we want to show is how uh, capabilities can be managed by SCCs. So in this case, we want to run an application that requires to sniff or capture traffic in the pod interface. As you may know, this requires high privileges. Okay, so then I am creating a new namespace. This namespace uh, will, uh, I mean, the application will deploy, will, will be deployed through a deployment. So we are going to create a service account. So the service account will be in charge of the deployment. So we can assign uh, permissions to this capable service account. Let's take a look at the deployment. We are going to deploy an application called Troubleshoot that executes TCP dump uh, with the service account that we already created. Okay, let's create the deployment. And as you may expect, there is an error in the deployment, so we don't have permissions to execute TCP dump to capture traffic. First, let's Check, let's take a look what SCC has been assigned to this uh, application. As you may know, it should be the restricted. It is the restricted one actually because it's the one that it's assigned to the, all the, the authenticated users to this service account. So this service account has been assigned this restricted SCC. Another thing that I want to check is the user ID. So as you may know, the restricted SCC doesn't allow to run as root. So the, the uh, user ID is not root in this case. Okay, so next thing that we can do is try to execute the, the application as a root user. And in order to do that, we need to create to a new deployment. This deployment is run as user in the security context. We are, and another thing that we need to do is assign an, the any UID SCC to this service account because the restricted SCC, as I mentioned before, doesn't allow doesn't allow to run as any UID as any UID that we require. So we will check that now the capable service account has two SCCs, one prior, with priority ten, which is the any UID. So it has 
higher priority, so it will be the one that will be assigned. We are now executing again the, the modified application, the pot is created, but there is, I mean, we, we are seeing the same issue. We don't have permissions. So what we are going to do is we are going to access to the uh, pod. The, the debug basically executes the same container but with the, the bash entry point. And in this case we are we are being I mean we are root, but we are having we are not allowed to execute the 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 uh, pod. So what we are doing now is taking a look at the uh, capabilities assigned and we are seeing that these capabilities it's not I mean the net row is not included. And that's why, because those capabilities are the ones that are uh, assigned by default to all to all the containers by the runtime, as we mentioned in during the presentation. So the next thing that we need to do is we are going to create a new deployment, and when we are explicitly allowing or adding this capability Netrow to our application, but this won't work out of the box because the any UID SCC, as you may know doesn't add any uh, capability. It, adds, it actually drops one and it doesn't allow or add anyone. I mean, so the, the, the next thing that we need to do is copy this any UID SCC and modify and, and create a new one SCC. I mean, the, the, thing that, the, the thing that we don't have to do is, is edit an, an SCC. So we are copying the any UAD SCC and we are adding the allowed capability net wrong here. So allowing this capability, we need to explicitly request it in the in the pot spec. So now we are going to create again. And we are going to create the SCC. We are going to add the SCC to the capable service account. And we are going to remove the any UID SCC because we don't we don't need it anymore from the capable service account. And now we are good to go. I think we can create the deployment that we are requesting being user ID zero and we, and we are requesting the network capability. And as we can see here, the uh, application is running. We can access to the pod and we can check as well the, the capabilities that has been inherited. And by decoding the capabilities, we can see now that the capnet row is included and our application is running successfully. So with that ends our presentation.